Okay. So I just want to give you a quick technology status and a slide full of uh, ideas that I can come up with and a couple of ideas for collaborations in this area. So some of the background, I've been working on wireless sensor networks for uh, over a decade now. And uh, one of the watershed events was uh, a collaboration with David Culler in computer sciences at Berkeley that produced the TinyOS operating system and you know, the whole open source moat uh, uh, phenomenon or whatever it is, research area now. And so many of you may have played around with these wireless sensor nodes over the last decade and uh, seen some amazing demos, but ultimately had some frustration with uh, getting them to actually work in your environment. And so the thing, one of the key things that I want to impress on you today is that, that those problems are now solved. There are still plenty of research issues in wireless sensor networks, but they largely have nothing to do with getting reliable data back uh, from your application at low power. So just as some examples of, the, of what, a wire, what I'm, kind of thing I'm talking about, this is a typical wireless sensor network that you might see. There's one access point right here that's plugged in. And then you've got, um, I don't know, 40 sensor nodes or something like that. This particular one is at a printing facility in Berkeley. Uh, it's, OK, 50 moats over three floors. You know, so a, a real facility with, with real obstacles. Uh, and one of the challenges in wireless sensor networks is to get the data back reliably. We've solved that problem. Uh, and what you see here is over a period of a week, this is back in 2005. Now, there's, uh, you know, there's a day where we dropped three packets out of the 100,000 the network generated, several days where we dropped none, but five nines reliability over that period. So we can give you reliable networks now. Um, power consumption, uh, this is a, you know, a real world deployment uh, at a oil refinery. It's deep in the bowels of this double coker unit. So, you know, real world distances, hundred, hundreds of meter uh, communication ranges um, with installation per normal practices for sensors and a lifetime, you know, more than five years on C cells. Now we're at the point where we're talking about five years on a pair of double A's. You know, these things are out in the real world. You know, Stat Oil, uh, N Norwegian oil company has them. They're sitting on the, the wellhead here out in the North Sea and so on. So the, the technology is really out there. Uh, it's being deployed in a lot of different uh, areas, street line networks. If you drive around the city of San Francisco near the, near the wharf area, you'll see that there are lane markers on the ground, uh, not in the middle of the street. They're there detecting whether cars are there. And if you know the right password, you can find the closest open parking space to your favorite restaurant. People are using them for uh, doing monitoring of HVAC, uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems in buildings, monitoring power consumption and have shown that you can increase occupant comfort and decrease uh, energy uses at the same time. So the point is they're, they're real, they're really happening out there uh, today. And if, if your application just needs you to get sensor data back from a bunch of different things, potentially moving things, that's something uh, that we can do with off-the-shelf technology today. Uh, next generation. Uh, six months ago, I guess, was the, the first one of these. My student, Stephen Lanzacera, uh, got up and presented a, a slide that looks something like this. He's working on next generation hardware that does RF time of flight. So it measures the round trip time that it takes the radio waves to propagate between all of the sensor nodes in the network. And that lets you do a uh, very accurate location. I guess you saw this morning an example of an AeroScout. Was that demonstrated? I don't know. If, so the, the, so uh, Wi-Fi tags for location are something that people are talking about a lot in uh, healthcare among other areas. This is kind of the next generation beyond that in terms of accuracy and power consumption and, and ultimately cost. Um, so that's something I'll say a little bit more about. Um, and uh, then new sensor platforms. So this is an inertial sensor. It's got a three-axis accelerometer, three-axis gyro. So it can track the motion of uh, a, a patient or limbs of a patient or something like that. You can, you can see range of motion in normal daily life. Um, we've, we've bolted these things onto uh, uh, laboratory rats uh, in a friendly sort of way uh, to monitor their activity during um, uh, drug testing and, and so on that Stephen talked about last time. 
Um, so if you know, there, there, there are dozens and dozens of different kinds of sensors that you can buy off the shelf that are that are inexpensive. So we can sense just about anything that you can uh, that you would be interested in sensing, and wirelessly connect that. On the location side, so if you had seen this demo uh, earlier, you would have have uh, seen a wireless tag that's talking to the access points that Eric was pointing to earlier. So there's four in this, in this room. And the traditional way of doing location today, and some of you may have played around with this, is you put in a fixed infrastructure. That's the blue dots. And then you measure received signal strength uh, at a, you know, one or more, typically a lot more, mobile nodes that go around inside the network. That's kind of the, the standard that people are doing today. What we're talking about is a couple of steps beyond that, where you have you know, uh, a small number, possibly one, possibly zero access points, and it's actually the interrelationship between the tags that you're measuring, and that's also providing the networking that gets the data back to the central location. So it completely changes the economics of this, right? If I need to measure where things are and I have to install uh, Wi-Fi wired access points everywhere inside a structure, that's a very expensive proposition. Um, and it turns out that the uh, density of those access points needs to be substantially higher than what you would normally put in to get uh, connectivity because it's not enough just to have your laptop talking to one of these things. Your tag has to talk to at least three and preferably more in order to get the, the accuracy of the measurement. And so the result is if you look at what Cisco and Aeroscout and those companies are talking about, they're talking about access point spacing of 20 meters, which is probably about what we've got in here for these four. If you've got to cover the entire hospital or whatever facility at that density, that's a very expensive proposition. And if you're trying to do that in some sort of emergency response or something uh, scenario, uh, also very, very difficult. Um, using uh, moat technology, you can, you know, the, the, the spacing is much, uh, much broader than that. It turns out uh, this time of flight is much better at measuring distances. I'm not putting a confidence on this, but, you know, because, well, Stephen's not here, so I can I'm gonna, I would say 90%. Stephen would kill me. He's the guy who's actually got to do it for his PhD and say that's a 50% that's a, a number, not a 90%. But it's, it's a very different proposition. Lots of applications, this is plenty good enough. Lots of applications, you've got Wi-Fi installed already. If that works for you, great. It's an awesome way of going about it. But for, for many applications, not knowing what room you're in or what floor you're on even just doesn't cut it. And you need to know something more than that. So... Um, some of the applications, uh, just finishing up, I think you know, hospitals or facilities, there's facility management issues that we've got to deal with, but probably most of you are more interested in the uh, uh, care side of this. And things that I would love to see just based on personal experience in, in hospitals is being able to unwire myself from the hospital bed uh, or, or unwire my loved, loved one from the hospital bed. Um, but also tracking uh, mobility and behavior of, of patients, I think, is something that Rujna Baichi at Berkeley has been doing. It's an interesting um, area. There's a, uh, all of these. I've, I've talked to medical companies that are interested in doing these things. Um, and then on the tracking side, I think uh, I, there, there's a lot of literature out there, uh, individual experiments showing that you can dramatically improve care and reduce hospital costs by knowing where everybody is all the time. So that's, that's been done in the past with uh, expensive uh, infrastructure. We have the potential of doing this very, very inexpensively. Um, tracking the patients uh, and their, you know, their, uh, um, uh, I don't know, various uh, things that you want to measure on them, like John showed um, earlier on, um, both in inpatient and outpatient. You know, seeing what they're doing around their their homes and so on. Um, you know, I guess goes up to the to the behavior side of things. It's okay to be lying down, but not if you're in the kitchen, things like that. And then, and then finally, tracking uh, the, the things that drugs come in is probably the, the place to start. And you know, only having the green light go on on the container when that container is next to the patient that the uh, particular drug is supposed to be administered to. So just a, this is just a, a quick list. I had a, uh, a, just a few minutes to, to write down some of the ideas I was thinking of uh, on my way over here. So um, modes of collaboration. Lots and lots of this technology exists out there. Um, and perfect project opportunities for undergraduates to take existing uh, technologies and combine them uh, together for a new application. So that's something, we'll, so we're, we're, we have a collaboration initiated already to uh, do monitor uh, doctors uh, how often they're washing their hands or if they're washing their hands uh, 
the right amount, and that's you know, using off-the-shelf technology and just writing a little software and doing a little bit of hardware, we should be able to monitor the sinks, see when they're turning on the water or when they're, they're hitting the soap button, see what doctor it is that's next to that, see when they're interacting with their patients, um, and just get that data back and start monitoring whether there's a relationship between that and uh, the spread of infectious diseases or whatever it is that, that people are interested in doing. Um, if we need to you know, show that we can do a better job of monitoring than what is possible with uh, existing technologies, we need more accuracy or something like that, or there's some new sensor that needs to be implemented, then that's where you get the grad students involved to push the state of the art. And these are the two that I'm most interested. I, I like getting involved early in projects like this. Um, writing, uh, you know, uh, joint proposals to, you know, NIH or what have you, I think, is a, a wonderful thing to do, but that's, uh, I, I'm much more interested in the immediate short-term kind of things and let other people go and, and write gigantic proposals and, and manage huge programs. So if you're, um, uh, but I can put you in touch with the people that like to write, write the giant proposals and, and manage huge programs. I'll, I'll, I'll just be the worker bee that makes it all happen down at the bottom layer. So uh, on that, I will turn it over to the next speaker.